Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this segment on the use of technology to help Caribbean governments and the private sector curb corruption. I am Doug Fraser, Head of Procurement at the Caribbean Development Bank, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. As the move to open and e-government accelerates, more data is available in an electronic format that can be mined and exploited, which in turn opens up new possibilities for identifying red flags for corruption and other prohibited practices. An example of this would be in the area of public procurement, where there are more cost-effective e-procurement solutions on the market and greater transparency of procurement data for scrutiny by the public and private sectors, as well as civil society more widely. One company that has been particularly active in offering practical solutions in this area is Microsoft. For example, they have recently been collaborating with the Open Contracting Partnership to increase transparency with advanced data solutions. We are fortunate to have with us today Norm Hodney, who is Microsoft's Director of Program Management for the Microsoft Advanced Cloud Transparency Services, ACTS. His team's mission is to mobilize the power of data and technology to assist governments to accelerate transparency and to enable them to achieve more. His work is global, but recently he has been working with several African governments, as well as governments in the region, to discuss new and ongoing digital transformation and transparency projects. Prior to joining Microsoft's ACTS, Norm's roles at Microsoft have included engineering, developer support, business program management, and project management in Windows. He's also worked in sales, operations, training, and compliance management, and his roles have included accessibility compliance, accessibility applications within Windows, and the development of international standards for accessibility. His personal mission is to enable, te enable technological solutions that make a significant difference in people's everyday lives. Norm, we look forward to hearing a little bit more about what Microsoft has been working on. Thank you, Dan. That was a very nice intro. Uh, yeah, I am very excited to be here and talk about what Axe has been doing over the last couple of years. Microsoft Axe was established back in 2020 by our president and vice chairman of the company. He uh, saw that what we were doing within Microsoft for compliance was leading edge and creating for us internally on our own compliance systems, better insights and actually starting to move our, our processes from being reactive to being proactive. So instead of waiting for a whistleblower or some type of complaint and then doing an investigation, we're starting to move our processes over to be proactive. Uh, some of the financial crime trends that we see in the industry, such as synthetic IDs uh, and that growing problem that organizations are having dealing with that, beneficial ownership and not having adequate tools or data to be able to uh, define what the beneficial ownership is and being able to do that in an efficient uh, way is tough for many organizations and of course regulatory scrutiny continues to change it's complex organizations need to adapt quickly to that and we're seeing that we need to find ways uh, to be able to adapt as well to be able to solve for these problems because we are taking the lessons that we've learned and we're applying them to governments we're looking at what we can do to help by mobilizing data that they already have and being able to give them better insights on that data so they can do the same thing about being more fast, more effective, more efficient at responding to whistleblowers or complaints, et cetera, and to be able to also take that same path of being able to move to being more proactive. So we see that data really helps drive everything. It helps really create better innovation the more data that we have. It allows us to be able to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to more sophisticatedly uh, be able to uh, spot these issues within the data that the data brings out for us. And we're also seeing that we want to create a single automated system. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we believe that. So 
we have four principles that we run by and we'll quickly go through this. It's transparency. And we believe that working and enabling governments through this data and through machine learning helps create better participatory democracies around the world. We think that the role of technology really does help improve governance. The more visibility you have, the better visibility you have, the better governance that you can have. Uh, we believe it's a public-private partnership, and we believe that that helps us create collaboration. And one of the things that we see on the public side of that partnership and collaboration is governments can really help with laws, regulations, and policy about what make and helping make data more available to everybody to be able to create these types of reports and create this type of visibility for organizations. And of course, the rule of law is important to us. We hear, we've heard from our customers that they're concerned that everything that we do fits within their structure, within their laws, within their regulations. And of course, we adapt our programs and our applications and solutions to be able to do that. So these are the different areas that we work in, procurement, tax systems, investigations, et cetera. At the bottom of that list, you see beneficial ownership. Beneficial ownership goes across all the other areas as well. And beneficial ownership is really one of the key solutions that we're, we are creating to really help enable all the other solutions. And underneath that, we have that unified data model. And when I was saying that we are working towards creating an integrated system, this is what we're talking about. We realize that in the future, governments are going to want to be able to compare information from budget systems, procurement systems, et cetera, all together to be able to get a broader view of their organization, a broader view of how the money flows, and a broader understanding of where potential corruption can be. And you'll see also down there that we're working in partnership and collaboration with other open organizations like Open Contracting Partnership, which was mentioned, Open Ownership open corporates, open sanctions, and we'll look at for other organizations as well that we can partner with to be able to utilize their data models for that unified data model to make it easier for people to adopt the data model and to be able to utilize uh, their data as well or help governments utilize their data. I'm going to be showing you the beneficial ownership piece, which I'll do a quick demo for you, but to be able to understand what you're looking at, we're gonna do a quick little tutorial here. And we take three different steps when we implemented this uh, beneficial ownership solution. We start with behavioral analysis. In this particular case, we're using procurement data. And we are looking, when we think about behavior, we're thinking about what is the activity within the marketplace? What types of services or uh, uh, support that they're providing the, the government through those contracting uh, activity. And that's what we call here this behavioral link. The behavioral link is the procurement contracting behavior. We then overlay that behavior with a relationship map, which takes the company registry information and then starts to make those connections. And we build out this, what we call a network map, this network graph, which shows a company like company A here and the other related companies, either based upon market behavior or based upon other uh, company registry information, like shared phone numbers, partners who own the companies, uh, et cetera. And there's more information that we also relate. Uh, and then we look at what the risk propagation is. So in this particular case, these red companies have some type of issue, like they've been sanctioned. And if company A is doing business with a government, and they also have some type of relationship with other sanctioned companies, perhaps the risk from these companies could be propagating to this company as well, and the government just doesn't know it yet. So that gives you a quick view of what you'll be seeing in the user interface for the demo. This is what the demo looks like. And to give you a quick overview of what you're seeing here on the left-hand side, you see a listing of companies with a risk rating and that risk rating was developed based upon procurement red flags and looking at the contracts etc and doing an algorithm to determine what the what the risk level is this highest risk is at top and it go, works its way down these are other related companies that you'll see in the network chart so this is an expanded view now of what you just saw in the in that that smaller view and these purple companies are related companies to the original company. In this particular case, this company was selected, which is this one here. 
And so you can see that this one already has a problem. It's been sanctioned or there's some other issue with this company. And you can see that it's related to these other companies. On the right hand side, more information about the two companies that were selected. And up above is ways to select different, different levels of information in, in this demo. So you can see the overall network of companies. You can see companies on a time-based synchronous view and an asynchronous time view. And we'll go through that as uh, we've switched to the, video, to the uh, demo. So this is the demo, same user interface that you just saw. And I'm going to pick one of the companies over here and we'll let the system refresh and be able to come through and show us. So I picked one of the companies over here and what you see in the center now is, here's, one of the, here's the company I picked, it's sanctioned. You see the complex network of related companies here. And, and as I go in and start looking at the details, you can see emails that are consistent across, that is being used, a single email that's being used for all those connected companies that you can see there. Uh, one of the things to note is that this is anonymized data. This isn't uh, raw data, but it's, it's actual procurement data that we've, we've gotten for 10 years worth of information. And you're now seeing what this network looks like. And if I were an auditor or I were an investigator, I would be looking at this information and starting to figure that there might be something suspect here. We don't ever say that any of our reports prove that there's any type of corruption, but it's an indicator that perhaps there's some corruption, perhaps some additional investigation should uh, be uh, had uh, to be able to determine really if there's a situation here. But if you were, attempting to do or if this company was attempting to do additional work with the government do some additional procurement uh, work with the government then this obviously being already highlighted as a potential problem would be indicator that you would want to potentially stop that tender i can narrow down the information by clicking on one of these related companies and now i'm just seeing a more condensed view for this information as well um, so that gives you an idea. On the right-hand side, there is additional information for these companies where you can start to see um, additional information about the company overview, a risk summary from the procurement red flags, either the risks are related to that specific company or indirectly with some of those other companies that it's being connected to. You can see contract activity, how many contracts they've had, the value of the contracts, the number of bids, et cetera. You can find out sanction information, et cetera, all here in the company information. So it's a very valuable way of quickly being able to do a, uh, a very quick basic audit or a further investigation of what you're seeing here in the network chart. So that's the overall network. What I'm gonna do now is move to the synchronous network and give you a view of a time-based view of this. And as it's refreshing, you'll see now as it refreshes down below, there's an activity over time chart at the bottom of the screen. And that shows on a quarterly basis what the activity is for the two companies that we select. So we'll select just two random companies out of this list. And here on the left-hand side, you'll see that the orange shows what shared activity they have. And so a portion, this is all their activity, that's what the pie chart shows. This is the 166 is the shared activity. And what's that mean? Well, if we go over to the side over here, we'll see that 67% uh, of the shared activities are similar items. They're similar tenders, lots, buyers that they're, that they're participating with in their tender process. And so you could maybe see, perhaps there might be some collusion in here, maybe that some companies get some procurement, uh, uh, win some contracts, and then the other company wins some contracts, and sometimes there are you know, shared activity there. Uh, and uh, that would take more work again to figure out. But also one of the more interesting things, at least the way I look at this demo and look at the data is the asynchronous view, because this potentially can show where a company uh, potentially was sanctioned, and this, this one shows it, a company was potentially sanctioned and they stopped doing business. And so in this particular case, company, this purple company was doing business, doing business. And then here in Q2 2016, 
they were probably sanctioned and then they started doing business as this other company. Again, that's an assumption. You'd have to research it, but that's the what the asynchronous view could do for you and you can see how quickly we can spot it. You can go up here and get additional information about the network of different companies. You can see that there's shared uh, bids and bid win patterns, and there's actually an individual who owns both of these companies. So you could probably guess uh, just from looking at the data quickly is that that's probably what happened. And you can tell that companies were sanctioned. Here's the 129 that I selected over here that has been sanctioned or there's some other activity against it. Uh, and so this chart helps validate that, the activity now that's happening with, with procurement. So that gives you a quick view of what beneficial ownership can do by overlaying from the behavior of the contracts and then overlaying company information, partner information, addresses, phone numbers, et cetera, being able to connect the dots between the various companies to be able to quickly spot uh, where there's potential problems. If you try to imagine doing this with a bunch of spreadsheets and try to analyze all the data in the spreadsheets, you would be taking a very long time to be able to get to the point where you could see this. And one of the things that um, I was impressed with when I first saw this report, because we're working with Microsoft Research, and Microsoft lead Research is doing some leading edge new implementation of this technology. Some people will say that, hey, we've seen these network charts before, but the magic in this, the real power in this, is that we took 10 years worth of procurement data, helped narrow down the search by using an algorithm that did a risk rating on the company so that we're only focused in this particular view on companies that potentially have problems, which really helps you expedite research uh, and uh, auditing capabilities. And so it also helps you when you think about performance of the system. If you have 10 years worth of data and you're trying to do machine learning and artificial intelligence on 10 years worth of data, that's a lot of processing time, a lot of processing power, a lot of costs, potentially without a lot of benefit. Uh, and this really helps you focus and really get down to the, the essentials for that. So that's the, that's the demo on beneficial ownership. This is just one user interface, a lot of different user interfaces, a lot of different ways of calculating risk could be applied to this, and this is just one suggestion on how potentially to do it with procurement data. So we'll switch back to the presentation. So that, I think if you have any questions on that, happy to answer that. But we realize that that user interface can be tough for some people to use. Frontline, like analysts within the procurement department, et cetera, may not have the training, the experience, the background to be able to really drill into that user interface and know what to do with it without a lot with a lot without a lot more uh, experience with it. So we understand that we need to have a user friendly user interface in this particular case this is a user interface for a tax compliance system for a tax commissioner level and you can see that there's income tax, VAT tax, corporate tax and taxpayer satisfaction. The whole point around this is that this is a quick overview of the overall tax uh, business or the tax office. And you can quickly see based upon the KPIs at top that then the this particular tax department is not making their numbers. They're under on their revenue, their growth for revenue is under, their taxpayer satisfaction is under, their overall estimated annual tax collection gap is pretty high, 21%. And they can drill into these dashboards, like in the VAT tax, you can see that's where the problem is. VAT tax and taxpayer satisfaction are the two problem areas on this particular dashboard. You can drill into this and get more detailed reports that help you start to narrow down what the areas are that you should investigate. And same sort of role uh, as far as the KPIs at top, some more details in the middle, and then even more details at the bottom with some risk scores, anomalies, indexes, and you start to see a network chart over here that you can also drill down into. So the point of this is you can have a sophisticated back end with a user friendly front end to be able to get access to that data with more of your front end personnel not needing a lot more training for this. We think that this is extremely important. As you're implementing something like this system, we believe that side-by-side -side operations, having perhaps the 
ACS system off to the left-hand side or your compliance system off to the left-hand side with your normal day-to-day -day operations team, uh, system on the right-hand side. So you can compare and contrast the information and review any type of compliance issues with whatever it ha potentially happens uh, at the time, like a tender. And the, we think that this is important when, for a couple of different reasons. One is that you can quickly implement this solution and get it being used in your department without having to integrate it into your existing systems. You can integrate it, but usually that takes more time and all that time that you spend trying to do integration is time lost being able to get these new insights and being able to act upon them. In the same vein, when you're implementing something like this, we suggest that you do an incubation team. And this incubation team takes some of your experts that you have within your area, within your department, bring them together, help them, use them to review the dashboards and reports, provide feedback on these, look at the machine learning uh, outcomes and see whether or not there are some false positives that could be cleaned up and made uh, easier for the organization to use. They make those recommendations back. They determine what type of training their overall department needs and then they refine their department's operations based upon these new capabilities that they're getting. And then when they roll it out to their team, they're able to then get their team trained and then the team themselves can provide feedback as they're using it on a day-to-day -day basis. They will see things, maybe again, more false flags that are being raised and that they can get those also fed back to the development team to be able to modify the machine learning to make it again more accurate as you move forward. So this is a way that you could do it. Of course, if you want to integrate, you can, but we should just suggest the side-by-side -side implementation. So with that, thank you for your time. If you want any more information about what AXE is doing, the types of solutions we're creating, the partners that we're working with, here's the site to be able to get that information. Thank you very much, Norm. That yeah. was a... a a real, fa really fascinating um, presentation. Thank you. Um, some very powerful solutions uh, shared there, um, which will be equally useful for operational staff as well as those, as you said, in compliance and audit functions. Um, I'd encourage the audience to keep uh, dropping questions into the box, uh, the chat box, and we'll come to some of those in just a minute. But just to kick us off, Norm, um, I think some people will be sitting there saying, this is fantastic, Norm. This is wonderful, but we've got a long way to get to where you are in this presentation. How, how will we start this journey? What, what would the first steps be? Right. Yeah. It, so first of all, we've met with a lot of agencies around the world and they all come at this initiative uh, where they have some large problems within their ages, agency or within their ministry, et cetera. And they're looking for technology help. They're realizing that data is growing exponentially and trying to analyze data, review data, do audits and investigations manually just isn't possible. It isn't possible today and it definitely won't be possible into the future. So we suggest that uh, each uh, department that's thinking about doing this start to focus on what they want to achieve. And we're there's a lot of different ways that people can approach this. They can say we want to be more effective and more efficient at what we're doing, what our operations are. We want to provide better uh, visibility into the suppliers and contractors that we're using so that we understand that they're already compliant before we contract them instead of waiting until after the fact where there's problems or there's reported issues with them. Also, Organizations want to reduce costs of procurement, so finding more efficient ways of doing procurement and increase tax collections, et cetera. Some may want to speed the process of uh, providing permits and licensing to citizens and be able to reduce the opportunity for bribery in that process. So pick a spot, pick something that you want to do, and then create that vision around what your organization would do now that you know what you want to accomplish. What would your new organization look like? What would those processes look like? Sometimes it takes a bit of time to figure that out because you don't understand the technology. And when you first start, you understand where you want to be and that's good enough. And just having a high level vision is great. 
The next thing you need to do is understand what the legal issues are, and hopefully you've already done that. But if you haven't already, then you're going to want to uh, find out what the laws and regulations and policies are that either enable you or maybe block you from implementing these types of solutions. Uh, executive sponsorship is extremely important within your organization, but also within stakeholder organizations. You want to be able to do a roadshow, get out there, explain to other stakeholders what you're planning on doing, get their feedback early on so you can incorporate that into your plans. And ultimately, the building a uh, culture of transparency about anti-corruption within your own organization, but also thinking about how do you want to communicate to your citizens about the work that you're doing and the ongoing uh, progress that you're making in this. So thinking about what that communications and I'll say marketing uh, and a positive side of marketing, you're not trying to spin things, you're trying to actually communicate that and get people to understand that compliance is important, transparency is important, and we're working towards that. We need your help. So those are ways to get started. And you'll notice I didn't talk about technology hardly at all in that. It's really about the organization, your view, getting you set up for success within your organization. Thanks. Um, one of the questions that's come in has actually touched on an area which I think is particularly relevant. Um, many organizations will feel at the moment much of their data is not in electronic form. Perhaps it's not as thorough as it should be. How do we deal with that when we approach these types of um, implementation exercises? Yeah, right. So many organizations are like that. And what I think the first thing to do is Commit to moving to the cloud as much as possible. I know that there can be uh, restrictions on being able to move to the cloud and what data can move to the cloud, but there is uh, tools in place that can help you assess your current data landscape, whether that's documents, spreadsheets, databases, on-premises, in the cloud, and that these automated systems can help you categorize the data that you currently have, determine what the sensitivity of that data is, and make a determination of what data can live in the cloud and which data needs to be on premises. And then we can apply different techniques like data encryption, et cetera, to help with that. So if data needs to go to the cloud to have like machine learning done on it, it can be encrypted uh, in transit, encrypted when it's in, at rest um, in the cloud and actually encrypted during processes processing as well. So it can be very secure, but you wanna make sure that you understand what your data landscape is. And that's, that is just part of what we do, uh, is part of what the services that we offer is a, a helping you build a roadmap, uh, understanding what your current data landscape is, and then building that path forward to getting you in a more automated process. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a, a specific question from the audience about the use of this technology in the banking sector uh, for due diligence. Um, is that something that has actively been explored? It is. Uh, I think I get a request every day <laughs> about our focus today. Uh, my group is responsible for working with public sector, so working with governments, and that has been our main focus. We are getting a lot of requests from banks, financial institutions, uh, and other corporations just wanting to have better compliance systems because just like Microsoft, we have to create our own compliance systems. And there isn't anything really off the shelf that's going to satisfy anybody in this particular area of transparency, anti-corruption. You can find some solutions, but what we find is today at least that, that customizing these solutions is important. And we are in discussions about right now doing a pilot perhaps with a bank uh, in a particular particular region. Uh, and we'll, we're gonna use that as a basically a case study to determine what we would do moving forward with that. You can, I saw that there's another question around, can we use different data sources? And absolutely, more data sources, the better. Uh, on the back end, you have data scientists that sit there and take the new data sources and figure out what's the right way to map it into the machine learning models to be able to develop that mapping that you saw, the graph. Uh, and that can be done. The governments themselves or the banks, let's just say banks as well, potentially in the future, don't have to necessarily have data scientists on their staff. But if they're working with a technology vendor, that vendor would and would help you build the models as you're, build, as you're pulling in that data. 
And that's one of the reasons why we're working with open contracting partnership and, and open ownership, et cetera, is we want to understand what those data models are that support those different initiatives. Uh, and we're expecting that there'll be sovereign data, you know, government data, there'll be publicly available data that the government has, but then also publicly available data from these open organizations and then commercial data from organizations like Moody's. Uh, that you can bring in and integrate into your system. The benefit of that is you'll get a more holistic view of data that's, that is available for your particular topic. Uh, and of course, if you have other banking information as well, as long as you have agreements that you can utilize that data, you could bring in the data. Okay, and we're of course very aware there's a, a long list of existing sanctions lists, uh, anti-money laundering lists, et cetera, et cetera, which could uh, be plugged in. Right. Could I answer one of the other questions online? Yes, please. So yeah. The other one was, is the software available for anyone or only government? So we at Microsoft are very serious about ensuring that the machine learning and the artificial intelligence work we do is ethical and legal. And so we have internal reviews of the code that we're developing. And then when the code goes out and a customer uses it, there's an additional review. So that if a customer takes our code and designs a system around it with perhaps a technology partner with, from Microsoft, uh, when that design is complete, we pull that design back in and we review it again to ensure that it's being uh, operated ethically, it's designed ethically, et cetera. Uh, and that again, it's, it's, it's uh, designed within any, any type of uh, laws that exist that apply to it. Uh, so we're not making it generally available. We we are using GitHub, but we will have a private uh, repository in GitHub so that you have to be invited into it. That isn't that, but then there is a way to get the code uh, if you're looking at Microsoft Research work. So Microsoft Research works like other universities, et cetera, et cetera. They, they do the research, they create the code, they create the documentation around the code, and then they release it. But it's not going to have all of the capabilities, et cetera, that we'll have from the Axe system. Uh, but it has the basic code. So yes, you could get some of the basic code and be able to use it. Uh, and that will be open source. OK, thank, thanks. Norm, you, you spoke in your presentation a little bit about wanting to get this up and running quickly, having side-by-side -side operations um, as a uh, quick way for implementation. But there have been a couple of questions coming in about the opportunity for linkages with other systems. Uh, could you right. say a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so we've been working with a federal prosecutor's office with the particular solution that you just saw, uh, making sure that the machine learning is working appropriately. It's giving the right and accurate information back. Uh, and now the next step for Microsoft Research is they're creating an API for it so that it can be integrated with other systems and you can be more easily programmatically pull data from the machine learning model that we have. And also to be able to create the ability to print uh, reports, documentation from the system. So the information that you quickly saw on the companies associated with the graph that was presented there, uh, we're going to provide a way to create PDFs from that uh, to make it easier for auditors, investigators to be able to collect, collect the documentation uh, from that. So both things, uh, we, we've got those two features that are on our backlog right now and this next things that we're working on. Great. Um, there was a, another question that just came in about using the technology uh, to help target funding for developmental programs um, based on where there's um, positive aspects or where there's perhaps uh, concerns. So like uh, fiscal payments uh, uh, to projects that are like a government is interested in a particular project and they invest in it within their that's country. What, yeah. That's what I think is intended by the question, okay. yes. Yeah. So we're working uh, with uh, a government in Africa right now to develop a solution like that. Uh, and um, so we consider it fiscal payments, auditing, uh, the whole process around it. We have a forensics tool that we're going to use or that we are using uh, to be able to collect data in document forms, sound files, video files, et cetera, to be able to digitize that type of information to allow auditors to quickly uh, narrow down the information that, that they think is important. And so think about, think about like 
there is oftentimes uh, in this particular country where it's dangerous for an auditor to go in the field and audit these projects. And so if we can give them more information up front, like using satellite pictures or drone pictures of a construction site, let's say you're building a school in the area and you wanna see if there's progress being made on that school, you could use aerial photography and then use machine learning, artificial intelligence potentially to uh, review the picture and be able to determine whether or not there's been progress since the last time a photo was taken and be able to analyze that and see if it's appropriate. And giving all this information to the auditor, then they can make their decision about where to go audit. If they don't see problems, perhaps they don't need to go in the field to audit. Or uh, if they've got a lot of different audits that they need to think about and assess whether or not they need to audit. This is a way of assessing quickly, figure out which places they need to go in the field, and it can cut down the time in the field so it increases their safety. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at doing, and yes, absolutely. Um, and th that forensics tool that is able to analyze and process that information can be used for other purposes as well. There is a demo that we have which uses um, uses photographs of a harbor and looks for the ships in the harbor that don't have their transponders on because that's interesting to governments to figure out why is which boats which ships don't have that transponder going and using a bunch of different technologies together we can take that picture analyze uh, which ship is which based upon some other machine learning calculations and artificial intelligence to figure out which ship is which and then be able to pair the ships with the transponder information to be able to highlight which ships in the harbor don't have their transponders on. So you can again imagine manually how hard that would be to do. Here's an example of, uh, of how we can use that technology to do something in customs perhaps. Thanks. Um... I want I want to step back a little bit further um, from from where we started. You you were speaking earlier about as as important as the technology may be, uh, it's often the approach, the change management that will be crucial to the to the rollout. Um, what should we bear in mind in terms of change management when we start one of these projects? So yeah, I I think that change management is uh, extremely important as far as managing your stakeholders and understanding what your budgets are, the people commitment, the time commitment that it takes to do this. A lot of planning up front can help you be able to move your project forward. And what we've seen is that seen that it's not the technology which is the, the thing that limits a project. It's really getting the internal groups all on the same page. Uh, we've seen where IT teams are uh, territorial, I'll say, and they have a specific plan and they don't see this kind of solution coming in. It's not part of their yearly plan. They don't want to support it. And so you, getting those types of teams on board is extremely important. It's, for us, we need to be able to have access to the data. We need, if you want to integrate this solution with your existing solutions, you need to get the IT department on board, et cetera. So doing those kinds of uh, planning, that planning, that initial work of bringing all the stakeholders together, I know is a lot of work. I've done it before myself in corporations where I was in the IT team and trying to bring all the teams together to make that happen. And it's, it, it is a lot of, it's a heavy lift, uh, but it's really important. Uh, and then it's uh, a matter of just keeping moving, keeping the process moving. And I, my suggestion is that when you think about this, if, if your long-term goal is to be able to integrate into your existing system, great. Uh, the API will help you do that. Uh, but again, getting the system up and running separately will make it so that you can take advantage of the capabilities that the system has now. You don't have to wait for the integration, which can take 12, 18 months in some organizations before that integration is going to happen. That's a lot of wasted time. A lot more potential corruption is happening along the way that you don't, you're not able to uh, take advantage of the system to stop or prevent. And um, the system itself, we will have updates on our, our, our end as we keep on improving and modifying the code base. If you're separate and you haven't changed that code, uh, much. You can be able to 
quickly accept the changes from us and you'll be able to adapt those instantly into your or, or relatively quickly into your organization. So there's a benefit of being able to do that. So thinking through those kinds of processes uh, and how you want to be able to move forward and then being able to keep yourself moving forward uh, along the way. Okay. Um, I, I think often we, th we think of the, this type of technology in terms of the use of the internal stakeholders within the organization, but we've, we've had a, a question perhaps from the other perspective, looking in the information that's made public Right. Uh, you spoke you spoke about different views uh, dashboards in your presentation um what what do we need to consider when we're thinking about how civil society the private sector the smaller companies um might need need to use this information for their own purposes ah so is the question about uh, how does the government make some of this data publicly available and then other organizations can utilize it is that the question? Yeah, okay. yeah. How 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 would uh, that information be made available and potentially mani manipulated by those external um, ah, stakeholders? Sure. Uh, so one of the benefits of using a system to catalog all your data and understand what the uh, sensitivity of the data is and who should be able to access it and provide the security for people to access it, etc. You could set up as part of that process. Uh, different types of data sets, different reports, et cetera, that you would like to make available publicly. And then it becomes a, a fairly easy process of publishing that data and making it accessible to users on the web. Uh, and then you can provide either data analytics. I went up and saw the Jamaica site today that was mentioned in one of the sessions today, and I went and looked at that, and it looks it looks pretty impressive. They have some reports up there. You have the ability to have access to the data sets. And, you, and uh, normally the, the government agencies would provide different, different types of access, API access, spreadsheet access, uh, again, reports that are already generated for them. And then the users, the citizens can take that information and run it through their own uh, business intelligence systems to create their own reports, et cetera, combine it with their own data. And when you put in their citizen reporting capabilities as well, if a citizen sees something in the data that they think might be suspect or they have a question about, and they can raise that with the government, that's that's e even better uh, way that you can do uh, a better way to provide transparency, provide better services to your citizens, get them to trust the governments more uh, through this transparency effort. Okay, we're, we're almost out of time, Norm, but a final question, um, just, just to gaze into your crystal ball, um, what, what do you think uh, we're likely to see in the near future in terms of advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence, which would further enhance these types of solutions? Ah, so we're working on one right now. Uh, you've probably heard that we're working with uh, government of Paraguay through the Inter-American Development Bank. And we've done a pilot project on a product pricing catalog to provide a fair market price for the, the goods that government is purchasing. And we use that using machine learning we go through previous contracts and through machine learning, we build out a basically a high low price for all of the goods that you're purchasing. There's a lot of problems with the data usually in, when we do this, but we found a way to make it useful so that when you're thinking about procurement red flags, now you have information that you can use to highlight a, a red flag on a tender when if a if someone if a supplier provides you a bid and the bid is too high or too low it'll instantly be flagged in the tender process so there's another innovation that we're working on if you don't have that product pricing catalog today we'd be able to generate one with machine learning fantastic and unfortunately we're out of time um norm thank you so much for being with us today and, sh and sharing those insights super thank you very much i appreciate it I would also like to thank the audience, of course, and thanks for all the questions that came in. Uh, please watch this space as this evolves. And we're actually going to close out with our session today's um, events. So thank you to all of the presenters and the audience today. And we look forward to welcoming you back for day two tomorrow. Thank you.